This season. present Sherlock's Last Case, an affectionate spoof on the paragon of all detectives, written and adapted for radio by Charles Maravitz, with Dinsdale Landon as Sherlock Holmes and John Moffat as Dr. Watson. It's tea time at 221B Baker Street, London. I can see why the topaz earring led you to Madame Neander, and I can even see why the chipped tooth ruled out Graves as a suspect. But how in heaven's name did you deduce that Guy Hetherington and Madame Neander were one and the same person? Mm, almost transparent, my dear Watson. Well, I confess I can't see it. Pour the tea like a good fellow, will you? Yes. Do you remember when the maid asked Madame Neander for a light? Just before the guests arrived. Mm, yes, I vaguely remember something about... Mm, had your eyes been with Madame Leander, you would have noticed an involuntary movement of her right hand as it half darted to her breast pocket. But Madame Leander had no breast pocket. Precisely, Watson. A breast pocket is not a normal accoutrement on women's clothing, although it is fairly standard on a man's. Well, I must say, Holmes, that was a piece of luck. Two sugars, old chap. Mm -hmm. Holmes, you astonish me. Nonsense, my dear Watson. Any schoolboy using elementary intelligence and an applied grammar school education could have arrived at exactly the same conclusion. Assuming he was supremely gifted, of course. Mm. The only other time that clock refused to cuckoo was the fateful day I set off for the Reichenbach Falls for my last encounter with Professor Moriarty. Uh, but, but what? I mean, what could, what could possibly... My well, omen, Watson, that something untoward is about to happen. Aha! I'm so sorry, Mr. Holmes. Oh. I hate to bother you, but it's... This letter, Mr. Holmes, that Dr. Watson brought in, is from my cousin in Dundee. It seems my grandfather is in a terrible condition and will probably not last out the week. Oh, I'm terribly sorry to hear that, Mrs. Hudson. You were very close, were you? No, not what you would call close. He was a, a distant relative, then? Not what you call distant. Uh, he was neither distant nor close. To tell you the truth, I never even knew he was still alive. <coughs> in that case, my dear woman, why indulge in the charade of melancholy? <laughs> oh, come, come, Holmes. Can't you see the poor woman is in a state? Is there something specific we can do for you, Mrs. Hudson? I must go to him. Even though he never knew you? I'm his only other living relation. Mm, I see. And how long do you imagine the pilgrimage will take? Oh, I don't know. It only says he's near the end. I don't know when he's actually going to pass over. Mm, given the tendency of the Scots not to part with anything already in their possession, he may linger on for a decade or two. That would leave this flat in a rather disconsolate condition. Holmes, how can you think of your own comfort when Mrs. Hudson is so bereaved? She isn't bereaved yet, Watson. Now, you go along, Mrs. Hudson. There's a train later this afternoon. We'll be able to cope quite well till you come back, won't we, Holmes? If you really feel you must, Mrs. Hudson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. I knew you would understand. Naturally, we will stop your wages until your return. Holmes, really? Uh, since you are leaving on a Wednesday, strictly speaking, I'm entitled to hold back this week's wages as well. Oh. Now, 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 don't... Don't you fret, Mrs. Hudson. Holmes likes his little joke. I worry about you, Mr. Holmes, especially since you started smoking all that, uh, you know what. I beg your pardon? It smells like flaming pig manure. Your impertinence, Mrs. Hudson, is almost as tedious as your sentimentality. Oh. Take your week's wages and go tend the dying. Oh. Now, don't you mind him, Mrs. Hudson. We know how crotchety he gets after a bad case. And remember, if you need anything, just... Telegraph. God bless you, Dr. Watson. Oh, smells just like cat poo. Stinks to high heaven. It's wicked, wicked, wicked.
Holmes, you behaved abominably to that old woman. You should be thoroughly ashamed. I have never heard such a cock and bull story in my life. What? You... You don't believe her? I do not speak of proof, Watson. But as we all know, the twin obsessions of the working class have always been absenteeism and tardiness. No, Holmes, I don't know what's been getting into you, but some of your views of late are almost balmy. If all the timber in the North American continent were laid end to end, it would never even begin to bridge the gap between my insights, Watson, and your perceptions. Mm. The last... The first bitter fruit of Mrs. Hudson's untimely departure. Now I must answer the front door no, myself. Don't fret, Holmes. You're getting to be like an old woman. I'll get the door. Oh. <sighs> What is it, Watson? Um, a hand-delivered letter. Oh, too early for bills and too late for birthday greetings. I wonder what... Hello. Well, what is it? What indeed? Well, what's it say? Mm, it's from a Moriarty. Hmm? What? Moriarty? But he's dead. I mean, how... Mm, not how... the Moriarty. A Moriarty. Uh, a Mr. Simeon Moriarty, son, as it appears, of the deceased professor. I never knew that Moriarty had had a son. <laughs> Villain that he was. I suppose he was still capable of biological reproduction. Well, read it out, for goodness sake, Holmes. I'm dying of curiosity. Mr. S. Holmes is the salutation. Blunt and to the point. Having recently returned from foreign parts, I have only just been advised of your role in my father's untimely death, which... To put a finer point to it, one would call murder. Mm -hmm. You should understand that the Moriarty clan was fired in the crucible of family pride, and the inevitable corollary of that pride is the appetite for revenge. A revenge which is implacable and which neither God, nor man, nor as Sherlock Holmes can possibly gainsay. Be advised, therefore, that appropriate measures will be taken to redress these heinous wrongs and due punishment meted out to their contemptible instigator. Your obedient servant, Simeon Moriarty. Copies to London Times and Scotland Yard. Oh, oh it's just a hoax. Wouldn't give it a second thought. Mm, hello, what's this? An enclosure. Mm. Mm. If you would know the hornet's sting, seek the insect in his nest. But do not dare to cut his wing. Or never shall your heart know rest. Oh, balderdash. Hold its sting, cut its wing. <laughs> Rubbish. It won't stand comparison with Tennyson, I grant you. But then the intention is quite different. What intention? If you would know the hornet's sting, seek the insect in his nest. Oh, poppycock. Some crank, I shouldn't wonder. But do not dare to cut his wing. Or never shall your heart know rest. Doggerel. Penny farthing rhymes. The intent is crystal clear. Now what do you mean? I can't make a head or tail of it. It means, my dear Watson, that within a very short period of time, only days perhaps, there is every likelihood that I shall be murdered. sorry to have kept you. I find I can't go a day without Boccherini's minuet, one of my many addictions. You wish to see me? Mr. Sherlock Holmes. At your service, Miss... Moriarty. Liza Moriarty. Do take a seat. Uh, Mr. Holmes, I know you have received a letter... From Simeon. Simeon. My brother. I see. You are... I am Professor Moriarty's daughter. Oh, quite a prodigious progeny for a confirmed bachelor. I, I'm sorry, I, I've touched a nerve. Mr. Holmes, I cannot begin to defend my father. 
I and the whole world beside know what he was and what evil he wrought. But when all is said and done, he was my father, and I still experience the odd twinge of filial respect. And so you should, my dear. The good that men do lives after them. The evil is oft interred with their bones. Uh, I believe you have that wrong way round, Mr. Holmes. I know. I find Shakespeare so much more amusing that way. Your mother... I was coming to that. I, I don't mean to pry. Oh, if anyone is entitled to these facts, Mr. Holmes, you certainly are. Do you remember the case of the vinegar-stained hat band? Quite clearly. Then you will recall that after a variety of unfortunate circumstances, you stalked my father to an old mill near Haddlesby, Dorset, where you temporarily lost the scent. Yes, I remember it vividly. What you never knew was that when he appeared to have vanished off the face of the earth, he was being hidden by my mother, a coloratura soprano who used that old mill as her practice studio. Your mother, Moriarty? But where in heaven? There was a trap door that led to an old cellar. Ah. And in that dark dungeon, my mother, whose turbulent talent was a constant aggravation to music lovers throughout the country, used to run scales from dawn to dusk. Hearing the sound of the diatonic scale emanating from behind the mill, he exposed himself to my mother, confessed he was being hounded by the police, and threw himself on her mercy. My father possessed a plangent baritone voice, and knew by heart most of the selections my mother had been practising. During a rather impassioned Allegro Vivace from La Forza del Destino, my father succumbed to my mother's adagio sostenuto, and intimacies followed hard upon. But surely Moriarty didn't just leave after that. He had no intention that his musical duet was to bear fruit. Really? It was only months afterwards that my mother had the courage to inform my father... Of the birth of twins. My life, no less than my father's, has been pockmarked with tragedies, Mr. Holmes. My mother soon achieved the concert stage. She gave a premiere recital at the Wigmore Hall on the 24th of November, 1889. 24th of November, 1889. But wasn't that the day? You remember it. I thought you might, though not half too well as I. It was a macabre incident. There was a short notice of it in the Times, if I remember rightly. During the last encore, as a result of a tremendous ovation in a rather unstable hall... The casters of the concert grand came loose from their moorings, and as the pianist hit the first chords of Spore's Blumen in Mine and Hats, mm. which, as you probably know, is a wild cascade of B-flats, yes, yes, yes. the instrument came hurtling down upon the unsuspecting soloist, mm. pinned her against the side of the stage, and lodged itself in her diaphragm. Oh. The oh. hammers of the upper octaves were wedged mm. lethally into her abdomen. And although a series of delicate operations managed to remove everything from E-flat to F above high C, mm. the damage was irreversible. A grim and fascinating account, madame. But I fail to see what all this... Has to do with you. <laughs> I was just coming to that. Pray do. That letter, Mr. Holmes... Simeon told me he was sending it, just as he described the gory details of the ruin he intends to wreak upon you. If I can lead you to him, would you promise to reason with him? The actual confrontation with you would be enough to disperse his wild fancies. <laughs> My dear Miss Moriarty, I am Sherlock Holmes. That is a name and reputation well known throughout these British Isles, and, I dare say, beyond them. You are asking me to go to a young hothead and dissuade him from a vengeful course of action, the inference being to the uninformed that I fear his designs. But if you can restrain Simeon, I will tell the world the true circumstances. And when I have done that... Your behaviour, rather than smacking of cowardice, will be wreathed in magnanimity. 
Here is a boy whom you could have crushed as you did his father. Instead, you have given him a stern reprimand and an opportunity to mend his ways. Mm. Put that way, I must say it has a certain ring to it. Will you do it? Mm. I have always heard that one of the things that made Sherlock Holmes the great Sherlock Holmes was that he managed to temper justice with charity. Miss Moriarty, you are as eloquent as you are charming. You have a bargain. Find the hothead, and I shall endeavour to cool his brow with the cold compress of reason. Oh, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> oh. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I lost my head. Recover it immediately, Miss Moriarty. Emotional effusions of that sort are the dry rot that weakens the timbers of masculine resolve. I'm very sorry. It will never happen again. On the other hand, don't make long-range plans. You may have to amend. Of course. But be advised, Miss Moriarty, that if after two weeks you have not located him... It were better you retire from the scene and let destiny take its inexorable course. Your terms are completely fair, Mr. Holmes. It strikes me, Miss Moriarty, there is one refreshment I can offer. A bottle of Chateau Neuf du Pape, 1794, which I keep for very special occasions, of which this is certainly one. Ah. Uh. Would you be rash enough to indulge with me? Yes. You have the brightest, most intense and exciting eyes I have ever seen in a woman, Miss Moriarty. Everyone says I get them from my father. Lestrade, you are making a bloody nuisance of yourself. Holmes, this letter constitutes a threat on your life, and I'm obliged to take it seriously. Mm. This is no ordinary crank, you know. Mm -hmm. This is the son of the most notorious scoundrel that ever prowled the streets of London. In any case, we've taken some subtle precautions. Mm. If you're referring to those beefy bobbies you posted outside my front door, I can tell you right now, Lestrade, they will have to go. You may think all of this a big joke, but Dr. Watson and I feel ah, that... So you consulted with Dr. Watson? Dr. Watson and I, and all of Scotland Yard, have your best interests at art, Mr. Holmes. Bollocks. Still, Dr. Watson and I thought it would be a good idea. I wonder what's become of him. We arranged to meet here at 2.30. Not like him to be late. To meet here? To try to persuade you to... Stand back, Mr. Holmes! There's someone in that closet. Astonishing deduction, Lestrade. Stand back. He may be armed. Highly unlikely. He wouldn't be thumping the door with his elbows. Eh? Good God. Dr. Watson, what are you doing in there? How did you get in that closet? What in heaven's name has happened to you? I believe the answer to all those questions might be facilitated if you remove the gag from the poor fellow's mouth. What? Oh. Dr. Watson, are you all right? Oh, oh yes. Drink, drink. Good God, man, you, you look terrible. Oh. How long have you been in there? Are you all right, Watson? Barely. Have a swig. Ropes, Lestrade. Thanks, Holmes. What's happened, for God's sake? Well, I'm, I'm not at all sure. I was, uh, yeah, I was just sitting in the study, c correcting a few pages for my next edition, and I heard this um, buzzing against the window pane. I came in to have a look, opened the window, and the next thing I knew, everything went black. Did you get a look at him, Watson? No, not a glimpse, I'm afraid. This, no doubt, was the visitor at the window. That? Why, that's just a dead worm, isn't it? A hornet, actually, a Vesper Craver, if I'm not mistaken, ingeniously glued to the outside of the window. You see, it's actually stung the glass. A hornet? Yes, you may recall, Watson, 
We were given notice of a hornet sting some short while ago in an unpublished piece of light verse. Oh. What's that all about? Uh, nothing important, Lestrade. Go on, Watson. Um, well, uh, well, there's nothing more to tell. <laughs> I open the window and then... And then, whoever it was who arranged the hornet sting, placed chloroform over your face, tied you hand and foot and bundled you into that closet, leaving the way he got in, across oh. the window ledge to the drain pipe and down to the pavement. <laughs> You can just smell the faint whiffs of the chloroform on your lapel. But who in heaven's name would want... May I, Watson, I think this will contain the answers to all our questions. A letter pinned to his jacket, like a baby. What's it say, Mr. Holmes? It's addressed to myself. But what's it say? Nothing concerning you, old chap. For God's sake, Holmes! I can assure you that within 48 hours, the entire matter would be cleared up and Simeon Moriarty in your custody. Mr. Holmes, I can... As an inspector... I can't possibly... As an Englishman... It would be far too... As a servant of the Queen. Sir! Good man, Lestrade. Now, hurry along and walk out the front door as if nothing at all is amiss. Just make your way down Baker Street looking blank. Now, everything must appear to be normal. Mr. Holmes. That will be all. Are you quite all right, old chap? Yes, yeah, a little worse for wear. It's not very cosy in that wardrobe. Still, it was not a very long ordeal. You weren't out more than ten minutes. How do you know that, Holmes? By the residue of the chloroform, which was only barely evident. Yeah, but what's in that letter? <clears throat> An accomplished scribe, this young Moriarty. One feels, had he turned to literature rather than crime, he would have fared much better. It begins. As you can see, Mr. Holmes, I can penetrate your inner sanctum wherever I choose. Take this little encounter with Dr. Watson as a preamble to what is in store for yourself, although you will not get off quite so lightly as your addle-brained stooge. What? Signed, Simeon. Addle-brained stooge? <laughs> Little brat. Don't you see, Watson, his entire purpose is to try to rattle us with these undergraduate hijinks. Boorishness parading as wit, could anything be more British? No, Holmes, this fellow may be a puling youth as far as you are concerned, but he is a Moriarty, and therefore there's no telling what he might do. The boy clearly means to do you in, whatever his system is, eh? Piffle. What are you going to do about this threat on your life? Do, Watson, we will do nothing at all. Using the dirigible of our wider perspective and the helium of our lofty breeding, we shall rise above it. But what about Liza Moriarty? Her description of our wayward brother's character appears to be quite accurate. We have made a proposal to her and we shall stick to it. Holmes, I know you very well. And if there is anyone who can get round you, it's a pale-skinned, fine-boned woman with red hair, which perfectly fits the description you've given me of Miss Moriarty. Balderdash. Now, will you stand there and deny that you have a weakness for a woman of Miss Moriarty's appearance? My curiosity for Simeon Moriarty grows daily. I shall quite relish the encounter when it takes place. And now I think I shall have a little smoke. I see well, in that case, I'll be getting along. But I do wish you would take this a bit more seriously, Holmes. Matters of life and death are just flotsam and jetsam, but a full pipe, my dear Watson, is a good smoke. Who said that? I did. Is your hearing defective? Huh. I'll look in tomorrow. Do so. And be careful. <coughs> Hello, hello. What is this? A carrier pigeon. Come over here. <laughs> there, there, there. Settle, settle, settle. Ah, now, let's see. Aha. Uh -huh. A note. Hmm. Thank you. Come on, over here. There you go. Shoo. Interesting. Very interesting.
Holmes, this is absolutely insane. Let me ring up Lestrade. At least tell him where we are. That is expressly contrary to the instructions, Watson, and I do not wish to appear uncavalier. Lantern, Watson. Mm, yes. But you know nothing about Liza Holmes. And this Simeon, this crazy brother of hers, who's to say he hasn't arranged the whole thing as a trap? Who's to say they aren't both in it together? My dear Watson... When Professor Moriarty left his veil of tears, all real danger left with him. Now that he is gone, there is no one, no thief, no assassin, no confidence trickster, so deadly he cannot be disarmed by my superior intelligence. One may well call that arrogance. Indeed one may. Will it put your heart at ease if I tell you that the meeting was set for 11 p.m.? 11 but it's only 7.30. Exactly. I want you to be here well in advance of either Miss Moriarty or her brother. Oh, well, thank God you're still ticking away up there, Holmes. I had a terrible fear that that girl had turned your head. Well, shall we go? Certainly not. But they won't be here till close on midnight. Exactly, and therefore no traps can be devised. Oh, damn it, Holmes. I, I really don't know where I am with you. One moment you say there's nothing to fear, the girl is honest, and the next you're talking about traps being set. The only way to deal with a woman, Watson, is to speak to her as if she were an angel and assume she is a serpent. Now, Holmes, what if this boy gets out of hand? Out of hand, Watson? Yes, what if he becomes incensed and tries to do the job right here and now? I mean, how will you ward him off? If the boy does attempt a sudden lunge of any sort, I think my own jiu-jitsu training will be equal to the situation. Should it not be, this ring will do the trick. What? Hit him with that? Oh, God, Holmes, it, it would barely scratch him. Not hit him with it, Watson. Spray him with it. Huh? A carefully prepared solution of sodium sulphate and spirit of ammonia issues from a tiny spout in the heart of this ingenious ring, causing severe blindness and sensory temporary impotence. Holmes, I am continually amazed by your knowledge of chemicals. The characteristic of great minds, Watson, is the ability to transform the ordinary into the extraordinary. A bit like changing water into wine. Now, let's see. Now, what have we here? Hmm? Oh. oh. Well, it's, it's, it's some kind of barber's chair, isn't it? Or a dentist's chair. Some such. Ah! Oh, this is very comfortable. Wait a minute, what's this? What's, what, what's... Well, uh, here, on the, on the chair, some, uh, some, some lever. Lever. <clears throat> well, I'll be damned. I haven't seen one of these for years. It's a La Frontenac chair. La Frontenac? Mm, developed by a demented French dentist in the early 60s. His aim being to seduce a young girl who had consistently rejected his advances. When he sat her down, it closed up on her, just as this one does. Tipped back, and then, to the best of my recollection, he proceeded to ravish the girl mercilessly. Good God. Mm, an amazing replica it is. I'm afraid your own fears were, in this instance... A bit more prudential than my own. Now, how to get out of this thing? But is that possible, Holmes? Uh, is what possible? What you just said. What did I just say? About my own fears being, in this instance, more prudential than your own. I mean, that's never happened before. That I should have reached some kind of conclusion which was correct before yourself. Or, as it is in this case... By means of a completely original deduction? I don't wish to be rude, dear boy, but perhaps we could continue the analysis a little later. No, but it, it, it's really quite astounding, if it's true. I mean, deductions are always have been your own special province, your, your speciality, one might say. I can usually recognise them after the event, but never beforehand. Watson, these straps are rather tight. Yes, I know. I made them so that they would just pinch your skin enough to produce discomfort, but not outright pain. Allow me to take your ring. Yes. And the revolver. Hmm. Yes, you were quite right. Yet again, my dear Holmes, spot on. It is the La Frontenac chair, and you're quite right. It does tip back. Ah. 
And as you see, it is quite binding. Uh, since everything has an explanation, I assume this action has one as well. Undoubtedly, my dear Holmes. You consider yourself quite a sleuth, dear Sherlock. Quite observant. Very good at uncovering clues, sifting evidence, observing details. How is it that in all your many exploits, or should I say our exploits, you never noticed one recurring symptom? Hmm? I refer to a wince. A slight infinitesimal shiver which ran through my nervous system every time you asked me to corroborate some brilliant discovery of your own. A wince which punctuated every deft comment you ever uttered in correcting the muggy little obscurities and confusions of my own pathetic mind. A wince which, if it could speak, would have said, you arrogant, supercilious, egocentric, narcissistic, smug and self-congratulatory bastard. How you enjoy lording it over your bumbly, slow-witty, treacle-minded aide-de-camp. It starts very slowly, you know, very gradually, the way all great vendettas begin. A slight here, a sarcasm there, the ego first rubbed the wrong way, then bruised, then battered, then seething with convulsions of rage and dark dreams of revenge. And then gradually, taking your superiority for granted, taking equally for granted my doziness, my backwardness, my innate lack of perception. But who am I? Did you ever ask the question? I am a doctor of medicine. I trained. I studied. I was honoured at university. I received certificates. I won awards. But later, after you had insinuated yourself on my personality and into the minds of everyone who knew me, I was those things no longer. I was poor bumbly Watson, you know, the good-natured stooge of that detective fellow Holmes. Watson's the other one, the dull chap who never gets it quite right. <laughs> Are you beginning to understand, my dear Sherlock? When Liza Moriarty gets here and finds... Liza Moriarty? <laughs> Bertha Walmsley. You don't know the name? No, oh, why should you? A poor, out-of-work actress, grateful for any role that affords some small remuneration, even if only playing a fictitious character named Liza Moriarty for bumbly old Dr. Watson, given to playing practical jokes on his dear old friend Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Obviously a very underrated actress, for she took you in very well. But then I rehearsed her. And so I suppose the credit is really mine. And that letter from Simeon? I took it upon myself to write the letter in longhand. It was bravado, I grant you, but you see, I banked on the fact that through all these years you have been so consumed with your own affairs and so oblivious of mine that never in a thousand years would you have recognised my handwriting. After all, Holmes, handwriting, as you yourself have taught me, is something very personal to a human being. And since you have never, in all these years, recognized me as a human being, there was very little danger you would recognize my hand. And you really think Miss Walmsley, or whatever her name is, will keep your little secret? Oh, certainly not. It was important to select a performer who would not be around to stoke up any old coals. Miss Walmsley perfectly fitted the bill, as she is suffering from acute consumption and has barely six weeks to live, a diagnosis I carefully carried out before recruiting her into my project. The sum of money I provided for her assistance has already enabled her to set sail for Australia. In two weeks, she will be coughing up blood. In four, she will be bedridden. In six, it will all be mercifully over. Now, if you will excuse me... Watson, I think I've underrated you all these years. Oh, thank you, Master. Praise from Sherlock Holmes is praise indeed. How will my disappearance be explained to others? The 
But the fact is, I have become an expert calligrapher. I've got your own hand down to a T, and I, or rather you, have written the following letter, which will be found in your Baker Street flat tomorrow morning, I expect. <clears throat> Since the death of Professor Moriarty, I have felt no challenge in the art of detection. Each case has only been a repetition of former triumphs. Therefore, in my last communication to the world, I want it to be known that I intend to dismantle the personage that has become Sherlock Holmes. I am going off to start a new life in another land with another name and a new, entirely unremarkable personality. For all future inquiries, I direct you to my trusty colleague, Dr. Watson, without whom my entire career would have taken a quite other course. <laughs> I like that last touch, don't you? And you honestly believe that will settle the matter? Do you believe my friends will believe such a letter? What friends? Your only friend is myself, and I shall see to it that your memory remains untarnished. Oh, 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 I shall never deflate the myth of Sherlock Holmes. You can be sure of that. When Mrs. Hudson returns to London... You will have mysteriously disappeared, and no one will be more forlorn and desperate than I. By then, of course, she will have discovered that letter about her dying grandfather to be a cruel hoax. Another of my ingenious literary inventions but her capacity for lamentation will not be wasted. Oh, oh, oh. She'll have you to mourn and me to commiserate with. Oh, you must admit it is a grand design, perhaps the grandest design ever concocted by the mind of man. You are quite mad. Quite, quite mad. Oh, I know that. My own scientific objectivity tells me so. Quite, quite mad. But as with all madness, the first question the doctor must answer is whence came the disease? You are the root and cause of my madness. Your pride and arrogance. And when I realized that, Although quite, quite mad, I was on the road to recovery, for I decided to pull out the roots of my disease where I found them. No, 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 they're quite unbendable, those straps. <coughs> Only sophisticated chemicals in my laboratory, Sherlock, like this ingenious mixture especially concocted by myself, which kills in seconds. And within a matter of hours, thoroughly and efficiently eradicates human flesh, leaving a whittled-down skeleton like a chicken bone plucked clean. Of course, to do its job efficiently, it must not be diluted with oxygen. And so, my dear Sherlock, I took the precaution of turning this cellar into an airtight chamber. And when I leave, I will, using a wax especially designed for the purpose, seal the framework of that door, rendering this already dank and stuffy cellar entirely airless. I doubt anyone will venture upon the place as its condemned property due to be demolished in two or three years, by which time the chance discovery of a skeleton may create a small flurry of curiosity, although there will be nothing to connect those corroded bits of calcium to the great Sherlock, and therefore no chance of any serious publicity. Sorry about that. I have listened very carefully to everything you have said, Watson. You couldn't very well do otherwise. And I really must compliment you. You have devised what, in my professional opinion, is a perfect crime. Thank you. But in all your calculations, you seem to have lost sight of one rather 
important fact. Ah, here it comes. The ultimate coup de grace that makes 50 million readers tremble with delight and boggles the minds of criminologists from Peking to Peru. You say you were an underling and you say you resented it. And yet this, the most remarkable act of your life, could only have come about because of me, because of my influence and my instruction. Because of your arrogance and your conceit. Call it what you will. Who made you remarkable? Hmm? It was I. Without Sherlock Holmes, there is no Dr. Watson. If you kill me, you destroy the only thing that gives meaning to your life. On the contrary, your death is the only thing that can possibly restore meaning to my life. However, don't let me interrupt. Carry on. The acid is almost ready. Mm. You think you're so unique, so especially exploited. But there are millions like you. You're the drones of the universe. There are only a handful like me. Without my coattails, you drag in the gutter. Without my heightened sensibility, you remain a clod of earth. Carry on. This is the music I wanted to hear. Elementary, my dear Watson, is what you always were. Composed of brute and basic elements. Earth, air, water, but never. Fire. Go on, sing, sing. Fire is one element you always lacked. That I gave you, or rather you sucked it up out of the conflagrations of my intellect. For years you have warmed yourself with my coals, red by the sparks of my flame, lived by the heat of my fire. <laughs> Let's hear... Your favorite minuet. <laughs> you cannot destroy essence. I am essence. I am the incarnation of life. You are God. You are Earth. Why, come on. Still. From Dan. Dan. Good. No heartbeat. Dust we are. To dust we return. Elementary, is it not, Holmes? <laughs> Very elementary. A tea, Dr. Watson? No, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. I've had two cups already, and I'm just wolfing down the fourth of your delectable muffins. <laughs> <laughs> Fit for a king. And while we're on the subject, I shall now read you the contents of one of the letters you were kind enough to deliver to me this morning. Oh, is it about Mr. Holmes? Have they found something? Patience, patience. Ah. You see the seal? Is it? None other. But could it really be from... Attend. <clears throat> In respect of the magnificent work conducted by Mr. Sherlock Holmes through his eventful career both here and abroad, and the invaluable participation of his trusted aide-de-camp, uh, referring to me, of course, 
Her Majesty the Queen wishes you to accept a knighthood in the next birthday honours list, so that the world will be able to witness the esteem in which the monarch holds the memory of this great sleuth and his conscientious collaborator. Uh, that, of course, is me again. <laughs> Signed, Lord Privy Seal for Victoria Regina. God's truth! Is it true? It seems pretty authentic to me, Mrs Hudson. Does it really mean that from now on you are to be good lord? No. Oh. <laughs> Lordships are a step or two ahead, Mrs Hudson. But yes, it does mean Sir John Watson. Oh, dear. What would Mr Holmes say, I wonder, if he was here now? Something rather cutting, I suspect. Oh, but I do miss him, Dr. Watson. I keep thinking, one day I'll hear his tread on the stair. He'll swing open the door and shout out like he always did, Wipe me boots, you slovenly old cow. Oh, do you remember? Mm, an endearing harshness of manner that concealed a heart as big as a bun. But life must go on, as indeed it has for these past four months. And I must say, Mrs. Hudson, you've been a brick through it all. I know that's what Mr. Holmes would have wanted, to soldier on here at Baker Street no matter what. Wasn't it wicked? That fellow from Bogner pretending to be Mr. Holmes and getting our hopes up like that. Mm, a thorough-paced scoundrel. I knew in a trice he couldn't be Holmes. But he looked the spitting image, didn't he, Doctor? Got the voice down pat and even the clothes. yes. Uh, but when he offered to take us all to the Café Royal and pick up the cheque himself, he showed his hand. I just can't figure the number of wicked people in the world, Dr. Watson. You do think he's still alive, don't you? He will come back one day, won't he? Of course he will, Mrs. Hudson. You know what they say about bad pennies. Oh, please, please, Mrs. Hudson, you must learn to restrain yourself. If every mention of the poor chap's name is going to send it's you... It's not that, Dr. Watson. It's the ceremony. The ceremony? I haven't a frock to be going to the palace with. Oh, I'm sure we can stretch the housekeeping far enough to purchase an appropriate gown for the Queen. No, 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 it's not the door, Mrs. Hudson. Oh. It's the telephone. Probably the palace. Well, go on, go on. It won't bite you. The Holmes residence, your highness. Who? Oh, it's you. It's Inspector Lestrade. Oh. Good morning. I suppose you heard on the grapevine, eh? No doubt your own time will come. There's no reason why... Found him? What? You found him? Uh, oh, but Lestrade, we've been through this many times before. How can you be sure that... Amnesia? Bombay? Oh, really, Inspector, I think we're wasting a lot of time over... You've brought him here? Downstairs? Downstairs? Oh, do you think that's... No, oh, I see. Uh, test him on his home ground. Uh, yeah. Quite right. Well, I certainly hope this isn't another wild goose chase, Inspector. Yes, all right, fine, fine. Yeah, goodbye. Oh, they found him. He's back. Oh, come, come, Mrs. Hudson. We've been through this oh. many times before and have always been bitterly disappointed. But, Inspector Lestrade, he's never brought any of them over here to the flat. If we keep our wits about us, we'll be able to deal with the imposter. But what if it ain't no imposter? What if it's Mr. Holmes? Well, in that case, of course, I'll be delighted. <laughs> oh. Now, Mrs. Hudson, it would be best if you made yourself scarce for the moment. This is going to be a rather delicate interview. Uh, oh, of course, Dr. Watson, of course. Come upstairs, Inspector. Very well, sir. So glad you could accommodate us, Dr. Watson. He's just outside. You know, these false alarms are becoming very trying, Inspector. 
Must we really waste time on every single... I tell you, Dr. Watson, the man is the spitting image of Holmes. He's got the manner, the walk, the tone of voice, even if he is a bit scruffy. So I says to myself, don't play around with it. Give him the old Watson test straight off. Mm, I have a great many pressing things on my calendar, Inspector. The thing is, Doctor, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't investigate all these chaps. Just imagine that Holmes did come back and he was just shunted aside. Didn't get a look in, as it were. Very well, Lestrade. Show the gentleman in. Uh, many thanks, Doctor. I do really appreciate mm. it. <laughs> right, you. Come this way. <laughs> Watson, old man. How good to see you after so many months. Mm, what an escapade. Oh, you'll never believe it when I tell you. I say, the place looks as ever. Mm, is Mrs. Hudson about? Oh, I may actually be looking forward to seeing the old biddy. Mm? <laughs> First time that's ever happened, as far as I can recall. Huh? I say, is that my pipe? Do have a seat. Well, Dr. Watson, this is the gentleman of whom I spoke. He has a very interesting story to relate. And I told him it would be best if he told it himself. Quite. Mm. Oh, come along, old chap. There's no need for all this standing on ceremony. Mm. Surely I haven't changed all that much. <laughs> you certainly look the same. A little better fed, perhaps. I, I hear the firm has been getting on splendidly without me. Mm. Much trade? Before we become too deeply enmeshed, Mr. Holmes, oh, may I that? remind you that you are not the first person to try to pass himself off as the Sherlock Holmes. Oh, bother it, Watson. We both know all those others were sheer adventurers. Therefore, Mr. Holmes, I wonder if I might put a few questions to you. Mm. No doubt you'll come up with perfectly good answers. Holmes interrogated. <laughs> That's quite a switch. Now, perhaps, Inspector, you would be good enough to wait outside. There is a sofa in the hall. If you like, Dr. Watson... But uh, wouldn't it no, be better... I, I think that would be the most convenient. If I'm needed, I'll be nearby. <laughs> right, then, I'll go this way. Wait outside in the corridor. I do hope, Watson, that we won't take too long to break the ice. I certainly hope not, Mr. Holmes. Oh, come, come, old man. Surely we can drop the formality. I should like to retain it a little while longer, if I may. As you like. Now, I've drawn up a short questionnaire which has been useful in the past in trying to determine the identity of a would-be Sherlock Holmes. Oh, not that you, Mr. Holmes, are one. <laughs> I'm all expectation. <clears throat> Excellent. <laughs> Sitting comfortably? Mm -hmm. Good. <clears throat> now, imagine you were on your deathbed receiving the last rites with only one minute left to live. What would you ask for? A second opinion. <laughs> mm. If you were about to be immortalised in print for all time to come, what would you demand of your biographer? Fifty percent of the royalties. <laughs> if a fairy godmother appeared and offered to grant you three wishes, what would you ask for first? The credentials. Mm. Sorry, old chap. I'm going to give you some words, mm -hmm. and I would appreciate it if you answered me with the very first word that came into your head. Understand? Mm, beeswax. I haven't started yet. So, sorry. Windy. Macintosh. Waterloo. Napoleon. Rainstorm. Wellingtons. Africa. Gumboots. Siberia. Coconuts. Uh, danger. Banana. Kidnap. Sleeping goat. Strangulation. Underpants. Imposter. Prove it. Poison. English cooking. Embezzlement. Coconuts. Women. <laughs> Crocodiles. Marriage. Quicksand. Honeymoon. <laughs> Whale blubber. Mother-in-law. <laughs> Elephants. Corsets. Coconuts. <laughs> <laughs> Fame. <laughs> Money. Poverty. Fame. Money. Poverty. Success. Kippers. Celebrity. Cantaloupes. Securities. Pussycats. Bullion. Hollyhocks. Posterity. Coconuts. Emeralds. Coconuts. Oh, balderdash. Kumquats. Oh, enough. Chickadees. It's finished. Doomstones. The test is over, Mr. Holmes. No more words. Oh, sorry. <sighs> Would you care for some tea? Oh, don't mind if I do. <laughs> Milk and sugar? Ah, uh, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> I'd rather have this uh, delicacy from Morocco. They call it uh, happy syrup. Holmes, mm. it really is you. Mm. <laughs> I just couldn't bring myself to believe it. Mm. But, uh, 
How do you manage the cases without me? Oh, inadequately, of course. Our clients knew they would never receive first-class service with the master gone. <laughs> but they felt, or hoped leastways, that some of your genius might have rubbed off on me over the years. Gratifying, gratifying. Everything was going swimmingly until about two weeks ago, in fact. Oh? Hmm. An extraordinary case. This middle-aged lady from Cheltenham who tried to reach the spirit of her recently deceased husband through a medium. When she made contact, the spirit told her to give all her savings to the medium. Well, of course, it looked like a hoax, but the medium refused to touch a penny of it. And the lady? Well, determined to honour the word of her departed husband, she insisted the money be handed over. Hoax or no hoax. But the medium flatly refused to accept it, no matter what. Well, not knowing which way to turn, the lady came here to seek advice. Oh, I say, that is a bit of a pickle. Certainly foxes me. What would you suggest, Watson? Could you excuse me for one moment? Certainly. Lestrade, would you come in? All right, sir. Put your cuffs on the fellow at once. He's an imposter. Are you sure, Dr. Watson? Oh, yes, yes, not a shadow of a doubt. No, Watson. Dr. Watson, to you. I don't think No, you don't think. Certainly not very well, whoever you may be. Your replies to my questions were quite ingenious. Coconuts, indeed. But a moment ago, you dropped the fatal clangor. When I told you about our latest case, and you turned to me and said, what would you suggest, Watson? You showed yourself up in your true colours. Oh, damn. Sherlock Holmes dear, dear. would never in a million years have solicited oh. my opinion. <laughs> that was your fatal mistake. Oh, have a bit of pity, can't you? I'm only a poor entertainer. We've been trying to find a spot in the halls for over two years, but nobody wants quick-change artists. No more. Do you mean to tell me that you're an actor? Oh, I thought I could pull it off. I didn't mean no um, I have a pity. I'm just hungry. You'll be more than angry when I get through with you. I'm so terribly sorry, Dr. Watson. I really no, thought that no, he... No, no, no harm done, Lestrade, all part of the day's work. Oh, couldn't you just turn the other way and let, let, let me bugger off? I hain't done no harm. Misrepresentation, false credentials, and imitating a British institution without a warrant. I hope they boil you in oil. Well, what about my wife and kids? I hope they throw them into the same pot. Good day, Dr. Watson. Good day, Inspector. Oh, I don't, Come I don't, along, you. I don't, I don't mean no harm. Oh, God blast you both. I hope the ghost of Sherlock Holmes haunts you to your dying day. Oh, have a little, have a little thought, Inspector. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a family man. Please, 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 Another false alarm, Mrs. Hudson. No! I told you not to get your hopes up. A theatrical impersonator of some sort, down on his luck. What a wicked world it is. Yes, full of wicked, wicked people, Mrs. Hudson. However, life goes on, and I've a rather important errand to run. But I've almost got the supper ready. No, it's rather urgent that I confirm the whereabouts of an old friend, Mrs. Hudson, and I'm sure I won't be able to consume a mouthful until I am certain he is where I think he is. Oh, if the palace rings, take down the number and say I'll get back to them directly.
bones. <laughs> dust we are, and to dust we return. How true. Sorry, Holmes. Just checking. Nothing like being absolutely certain. You taught me that. What? what? Highly unreliable. Huh? Ask. <laughs> 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 Who's there? Who is it? An old friend. I will have a pistol. You, you'd better show yourself. <laughs> Pistols hold no fear for me. They never did. <laughs> A bit redundant there, don't you think? Have some respect for the bone, Watson. <laughs> <laughs> Mercy, mercy. I had to remove you, Sherlock. I couldn't live otherwise. I had to do it. I had to do it. Ha! Holmes! Did you hear that? Hmm? You've made a note of the exact words of confession, Lestrade, I take it? No fear, Mr. Holmes. Inspector! I've got it all down. But, but, but... but oh, but come, not. come, Watson. You didn't really think in your heart of hearts you could outwit me, did you? And I thought... I, I thought this... this, this skeleton... <laughs> Precisely what I'd have you think, old man. Same height, similar bone curvatures, and, of course, the mark of the clamp supplied to the wrist, which I was sure you would examine straight off. And you, Lestrade, you... You knew all the time. Not until last week when Holmes came to me with the most incredible story I ever heard. One that I couldn't for the life of me believe. That you had plotted to murder your good old friend. It was because I wouldn't believe it that we went to all that fuss to obtain your confession. Pretending to find that music hall entertainer. Exposing him. Making you think everything was just like you left it. <laughs> that quick change artist was... You. Mm, my cockney was a little rusty, I'm afraid, but I knew the only way to drive you back to the scene of the crime was to plant that seed of doubt. But where have you been? Everywhere they said I was, old chap. Madagascar, Calcutta, Saint-Tropez, particularly Saint-Tropez. Well, I, I, I mixed that gas myself. Mm. I listened with my own ears. Mm -hmm. There was... No heartbeat. A Tibetan yoga exercise, Watson, which suspends respiration and deadens the pulse. Had you used my hypersensitive stethoscope instead of your own standard model, you might just possibly have discerned the faintest of hums. But you were rooted to that chair. You couldn't escape. There was no way. There you... was one way, Watson, and I would have thought, being a man of science, you would have hit upon it. Hmm? My pipe. Although your deadly vapour began to do its job quite efficiently, and you were thoughtful enough to seal up any chink of air in the cellar, you neglected to remove my pipe, in which, thanks to a fortuitous wad of badly packed tobacco, there was an air block between the stem and the bowl. After you left, I managed to squirm the thing into my mouth, and that gave me just about 45 seconds of oxygen, enough time to topple myself to the floor and stick the stem of my pipe through a knot hole in the timber below which flowed enough air to combat the lethal fumes. Although the gas had no immediate ill effect upon me, it did, as is the nature of toxic matter on your hide, expand the leather clamps on the chair, thereby enabling me to wriggle out of their grasp. After all these years, Dr. Watson, to do such a thing to a good, unselfish man who gave you everything, it just turns my guts. I've lost all faith in human nature, you know. That's what you've done to me. Mm, we shall endeavour to restore it, Lestrade, and towards that end, I wonder if you'd be good enough to leave the doctor and me alone for a while. What? Leave you alone with this homicidal maniac? Oh, as you can see, Lestrade, Watson is quite helpless now. He took all the gumption he could muster for his one great gamble. That having failed, I really don't think we need ever worry about him again. Do we, Watson? <laughs> uh.
Go along, Miss Trade. You should be ashamed of yourself, Dr. Watson. I'll never be the same again, you know. You've shattered me, Miss Trade. I've lost all my faith in human nature. I've never heard of such a thing in all my days, man. <laughs> A touching fellow, Lestrade, despite his neantidal brain. All right, let's get on with it, Holmes. We have nothing to say to each other. I made my play and I failed. I'm ready to take the consequences. Even life in prison would be a blessing since I'd be free of you once and for all. Your lifelong incarceration serves no purpose whatsoever. It will make you even more miserable than you are at this very moment, and it won't do me a blind. Bit of good. What are you proposing? Just this, Watson, and I think it's a rather charitable offer. What charitable offer? I will take you back. Back? Back! To Baker Street, back to the firm, back to the fold. You will continue to chronicle the events, although you won't figure in them as prominently as you did. Of course, I couldn't possibly let you out of my sight. That would be far too hazardous. So I'll prepare a little room for you in the basement of 221B. To the outside world, Holmes will have returned, and the old partnership of Holmes and Watson lovingly restored. We would know the truth, but the public need not. You are suggesting the life of the walking dead. A fate far worse than imprisonment. Total and abject captivity to that man in the world whom I despise above all men. The alternatives are rather grisly. Mm, no more club, no more pub, no more dinners at the Ritz, no more handsomes, no more vacations in the Highlands, no more notoriety, no more esteem, self, social or otherwise, and of course... No honours. Honours? You haven't forgotten Her Majesty's gracious offer. What? You mean... You would... You would let me... Let you? I would insist, oh chap. It would be Sir John for all time to come. Sir John Watson, M.D., Ph.D., C.B.E., D.U.D. <laughs> Whatever. Well, I must admit, when I was informed of that honour... It was the first real flicker of happiness I've had in 50 years. Then why deny it to yourself? After all you've been through, no man deserves it more. Mm. And how the old bosom would swell with pride as you knelt before the heaving monarch, <laughs> surrounded by a crowd of admiring colleagues, yeah. and the royal sabre tapped gently on the shoulders mm. of your rented morning suit. Mm. Arise, Sir John Watson. Sir John. John Watson. Mm. No. No. Never. Never. I despise you. I abhor you. To rid myself of you, I have destroyed the best part of myself. I have risked ruin and degradation. It would make a mockery of everything to return now to be your serf, your slave, your hireling, even more devoted base than before. I won't do it, Holmes, do you hear? I won't do it. And you can't make me. You can't. Your choice. Pick up that pistol. <laughs> oh, they're coming. Oh. Mm, I, I think this occasion calls for a small drink. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. To Sir John, may he live a long and prosperous life 
and always remember this lovely day. Thank you. Bottoms up. <laughs> oh, it was just so lovely. There's no words for it. Mm. I've never been inside the palace before. Wasn't it lovely? Yeah. And didn't the Queen look lovely? Mm, a fine figure of a woman. A bit dwarfish, but the lifts do wonders. I didn't notice any lifts. The royal hem had been sewn especially to conceal them, but there's a tell-tale list in the monarch's stance which gives it away. Watson, did you notice as she began the dubbing, she was so far forward on her toes she almost tapped you with the hilt? I was uh, rather preoccupied myself at the time. And I've <laughs> never seen you look as handsome as you did today, Sir John. Oh, thank you, Mrs <laughs> Hudson. And... Uh, might I say that in that gown you two were quite enchanting? I managed to borrow it from my sister-in-law. Oh. She wore it for the coronation, mm -hmm. and we're almost the same size. Oh. It was my understanding, Mrs. Hudson, the extra six shillings in last week's wage package was specifically for new apparel for this gala occasion. Oh. I assume we can subtract the unspent amount from your next week's pay? Mr. Holmes, I was going to buy a dress where my sister-in-law kindly offered. Very generous, too. The most practical solution all round. Good God! No need for alarm, Mrs. Hudson. I expect those are the first volleys of the Guy Fawkes celebration. We can expect fireworks well until dawn. Not to be banned or let bother over a bounder like that. On the contrary, Guy Fawkes is the only explosive politician Britain ever produced. And it's only just tea time. They start earlier each year. But I still can't understand why you declined your knighthood, Mr. Holmes. Didn't want to steal your thunder, old chap. What do you really mean, Holmes? It, it was an entirely selfless gesture. Oh, I wouldn't go as far as to say that. Then why, in heaven's name, did The you fact not... is, if you must know, I have it on the authority of the Lord Chamberlain that in the next lists, it is even money, I shall be awarded a life peerage of proclaimed Lord Holmes, Baron of Baker Street. And, as I have every hope of a long and active life, I thought it more prudent simply to pass this year. Lord Holmes? God! I did, in fact, investigate the possibility of the latter title, but was informed the monarch is not empowered to confer deific status on anyone, alas. Well, of course, it's uh, just a piece of piffle, mm -hmm. but I must say I feel quite honoured. Ah. It left my station as well, Dr Watson, mm -hmm. when I go to market now shopping for Sir John's table. Ah. I won't be fobbed off with no pig's trotters or scrawny pork chops. Mm -hmm. It'll be prime cuts from now on, or I'll know the reason why. But, Dr. Watson, are you really sure you want to live down in that pooky little room in the basement? I can't for the life of me see why. Watson is a grown man, Mrs. Hudson, and if he prefers the intimacy of a small and frugal abode in our basement to the sumptuous salons of Harley Street... It is not for us to question it. It's so dark and musty down there. I don't mind the chores, Doctor, but why in heaven's name would anyone want to? Now that the regal excitement has subsided and the cucumber sandwiches have been fully digested, do you think we might return to more mundane matters? It isn't every day we have a knighthood, you know. No, but it is every day that the hall carpet needs brushing and the pantry cleaning, neither of which has been done today, I believe. You're as soft-hearted as always, aren't you, Mr. Holmes? I thought after your time away you might have mellowed a little. Wine mellows with age, Mrs. Hudson, but people exposed to the same process only grow sour. Oh. Oh, and speaking of wine, perhaps you'd be good enough to cork this and replace it in the larder. Oh, dear. Yes. All right, then. Oh. oh, spoil sport. Mm. Oh, dear. <laughs> Dear Mrs. Hudson, she looks exactly like an overstuffed saddlebag. When she walked into the palace ground, I half feared the horse guards would lead her straight to the stables. Um, mm. Sherlock, mm -hmm. about that room in the basement. Yes, Watson. Well, it's, uh, it's really rather cramped. And both of the windows seem to have been bricked over. Mm, there's a perfectly adequate candlestick. Y yes, I know, but... Uh, it's unrelievedly dark and dingy down there and very little air. Yes. Very like a place I've known myself. 
But oh, we shall I... see, Watson. Perhaps in nine or ten months, we can consider the whole question of renovation. <gasps> Perhaps one of the windows could be restored. Hmm? The smaller one. <laughs> oh, well, in heaven's name is that tiresome old woman. She really will be the death of uh, me. Shall I? <clears throat> Must be those wretched Baker Street irregulars again. They're always playing silly buggers with the doorbell. Nothing would please me more than to take them by the scruff of the neck and... <laughs> the doorbell was a device of my own, Mr. Holmes, to enable me to make my entry without... Obstruction. And what do we owe the honour of this, Before uh... we proceed too far, I wonder if you'd be good enough to drop your pistol, the indentation of which is quite visible under your waistcoat. <laughs> Many thanks. And now, if you'd be good enough to oblige me by sitting in that armchair, and you, Dr. Watson, over there. <clears throat> <clears throat> Since it is unlikely you are an autograph seeker, I wonder just who you are and what the object of your visit might be. I can answer both questions at once, Mr. Holmes. My name is Damien Moriarty. Oh. You were both closely acquainted with my father, I believe. Oh, really, Watson? This is too no, much. But, but Holmes... But a I... joke is a joke, but this is an appalling display of poor taste. No, I assure you, Holmes, I have absolutely nothing We've already to dispensed with... to the whole of this pointless farrago, your lysers and your simians, and, and if you think for a moment... No, I tell you, Holmes, Would I Would you have... please oblige me by shutting your mouth? My dear fellow, I don't know who you are or why you felt it necessary to play out this preposterous charade, but I can assure you we've had our fill of this Moriarty nonsense and have no desire to... That was the first bullet, Mr. Holmes, in the shoulder. The first of three that will be fired this afternoon. Shots that I've no doubt will be heard round the world. Although today, on Guy Fawkes Day, they will not be particularly audible. Who are you? You already have my name. My father was well known to both of you. Throughout his life, you stalked him from one city to another, and at the Reichenbach Falls finally hounded him to his death. On the day I received the news, I knew I would never rest until I avenged his death. Young man, no doubt it bolsters your self-esteem to pretend to be the son of the arch-criminal of the age, but as you know, there is no record whatsoever of a Moriarty offspring. I am not obliged to prove anything to you, Mr. Holmes. My mission is about to be fulfilled, and it will be exactly as my father would have wanted it. There is now one cartridge in this pistol. That is the bullet that will end your life, Dr. Watson. And you, Mr. Holmes, will be responsible for discharging it. What? That done, I will dispatch you as promptly as possible. But I'm on a very tight schedule. Time is of the essence. Therefore, I must ask you, with no further ado, to dispatch your colleague. Do you honestly believe if you that... you vote, I... I shall. And rather more brutally than yourself. Take your choice. Pick up that pistol. There's nothing for it, Holmes. It's providential it should end like this. My dear, what's... It's all right, Holmes. Just fate having the last laugh on both of us. Those four months without you were the longest in my life. I hated you. I loathed you. I wanted to be free of you. I was certain of that, but the fact remains. During those four months, I was quietly and inconsolably miserable. Perhaps when one hates someone as intensely as I did you, it turns into some perverse kind of love. I don't know. All I do know is this seems quite inevitable and quite just. Watson, 
When I realised in that contemptible little cellar that you were truly intending to take my life, I vowed with every atom of my being that I would outwit you and survive. And often, during those long months on the run, when I thought back to your treachery, I felt I could happily rid myself of you forever. But now, like this, I find that... <laughs> All of this would be very touching if I had the slightest idea what you were talking about. But the fact is, times are wasted. Holmes, I will give you a count of five to pull that trigger, or else you shall go first. You bastard! You really are a Moriarty, aren't you? Pull that trigger, Holmes! For if you don't, as God is my witness, I shall blow you to smithereens. One. It's all right. I don't mind. Two. This is the retribution I deserve. Three. It's been marvellous, Holmes. All of it. Four. I wouldn't have traded it for a barrel full of honours. Five. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. oh, get up, Watson. You're quite all right. <laughs> Off with the moustache. <laughs> Off with the wig. <laughs> Eyebrows. Etc. <cetera. laughs> oh, bravo, Miss Wormsley. Um, a trifle overplayed, perhaps. A little melodramatic here and there. But on the whole, quite convincing. Uh, I didn't think much of your performance, Holmes. Really? That fall to the floor was like something out of a third-rate rep. But life is like a third-rate rep, Miss Wormsley. The old exploding blood sack under my jacket worked a treat. Standard equipment at Ipswich or Hacksfield? <laughs> Very lifelike. Mm, what a horrible smell. I, I hope it doesn't stain. A little soap and water clears us of the deed. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Watson, bedridden and spitting blood in the charity wards of Australia... Is that what you hoped for? Sorry to disappoint you, but I am quite alive. No thanks to you. I dare say my consumption would have thoroughly consumed me by now if Mr Holmes hadn't sought me out in the slums of Brisbane and whisked me off to an American specialist. But some gentlemen really are gentlemen. <sighs> Got a clean bill of health now, and resuming my career thanks to a certain benefactor. <laughs> You've only got yourself to blame, Watson. You can't play fast and loose with people and not expect them to feel a touch vindictive. Anyway, it's all over now. Miss Walmsley's had her satisfaction, and you're none the worse for wear. Yeah. I, I must admit, I, I was quite touched by your remorse. Almost brought a tear to my eye. Well, let's all kiss and make up. Do tell the girl she's forgiven. May I retire to my room? Why, old chap, of course you can. <laughs> You're not a prisoner here, you know. May I say, Miss Wormsley, without meaning in any way to flatter... You are almost as fetching as a boy as you are a girl. In some ways, even more so. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. I wonder if I may ask you one question. Most certainly. I was very bitter when I heard what Watson had planned for me, and I am grateful you allowed me to get my own back. But was that the only reason you went to such length? Not entirely, Miss Wormsley. You see, I had to hear from Watson's own lips that he harboured a genuine affection for me, which I always suspected he did. Now that that's been confirmed, he and I are quite safe under the same roof for the duration of our natural lives. But as we know, Miss Wormsley, to be the subject of a genuine affection always puts you one up in any personal relationship. <laughs> and now I think this performance deserves a toast.
Is that your Chateau Neuf de Pap, 1794, for very special occasions? <laughs> you remembered. Agenus are trained to have good memories, Mr. Holmes. Yet another of your thoroughly enchanting attributes. <laughs> mm. Guy Fawkes Day. The fireworks have started very early this year. Uh. <laughs>